Good morning, fountains people. We are bringing you greetings and welcome from Mount Lemmon in Tucson, Arizona. Welcome to our uh, worship service this morning, and we're really glad to have you, and we hope that you can have a mountaintop experience at church while we're having a mountaintop experience on Mount Lemmon. I love the idea that we can worship anytime that we want with this online worship, and so we hope that you will join us. We come together in a spirit of gratitude, inquiry, and openness, ready to share the miracle of our common human journey. Jesus said, I have come that all people may have life and have it in abundance. So we gather to celebrate our faith. We gather to wonder in the mystery of the divine. We gather to honor our shared humanity as we live fully love wastefully, and strive to be all that we can be. Lift up your hearts to the Lord. Praise God's gracious mercy. Sing out your joy to the Lord, whose love is endured. mercy. Sing out your joy to the Lord, whose love is enduring. Let the earth worship sing in your praise. Praise the glory of your name. Come and see what God has revealed. Bless God's holy tell of these great works. Blessed be the Lord of my life, whose love shall endure. Lift up your hearts to the Lord, praise God's gracious mercy. Sing out your joy to the Lord, whose love is enduring. Lift up hearts to the Lord, praise God's gracious mercy, sing out your joy to the Lord, whose love is enduring. Let's affirm the fountain's mission together. As followers of Jesus, we put love first. Our guest preacher today has written, I understand prayer to be my attempt to commune with the holy, to be open to the holy, to allow the holy to live through me. So as we enter into this time of centering, I encourage you 
to be mindful of the gift of life, to be open to the Spirit's presence, and be alert to ways the mystery of the divine is working its way in the deepest parts of who you are. Close your eyes, relax, and notice each breath, conscious of the process of breathing in and out, being present to your here and now. together in our unison act of awareness in this caring and supportive community during this time of prayer and quiet reflection we come to be empty when empty we long to be filled filled with the spirit that flows in us and among us and throughout the world we are struck in awe before the mystery of the cosmos and are powerfully moved by a deep concern for our world and our care for one another. We give thanks for the spirit of creativity that inspires and encourages, that brings novelty in the midst of familiarity and risk in the midst of comfort, that surprises in the midst of commonplace. As the spirit moves in us, we give thanks for this day and for those gathered here. We give thanks for the love which created us, the grace which restores us, and the spark that links us to others in both struggle and in joy. May we always seek to know the presentness of, of the source of life. We offer this time of quiet, bringing our whole selves in the name of the one who taught his first followers to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Where love and care Oh
At the Fountains, we are agents of change. And we know that it's not enough to just believe, especially now, we take action. And one of our longtime partners, the Justice Center, is in need of several things to help keep their area safe and clean, not just at the center, but for their residents as well. They are in need of powdered cleansers, such as Comet, kitchen dish cloths and dish towels, Lysol and other disinfectant sprays, and cheap washcloths. If you're interested in purchasing these items, you can send them directly to the Justice Center. One final thing, in the upcoming weeks, we will be collecting funds for the Justice Center's nursing clinic. So stay tuned on how we can support that vital mission. In the meantime, be blessed, be safe, and know that you are loved. Even in the midst of the pandemic, the Fountains continues to put love first. And just since March has touched the lives of literally thousands of people, not just through our online celebrations, discussion and support groups, but with the coordination of practical and tangible help for our neighbors and one another. Your generous giving has helped make this possible, but we still need your help. If you felt inspired, encouraged, or have been given the opportunity to reach out to your neighbor through what we've been doing, I hope that you'd make a generous gift toward our continued work. There are all kinds of easy and secure ways for you to donate. You can go to give.weputlovefirst.org or our homepage, weputlovefirst.org and press the blue Donate Here button. You can download the Give Plus app on your phone or just drop a check in the mail. Now more than ever, as we seek to follow Jesus in this increasingly complex reality, the world needs every beacon of unconditional love, theological integrity, and hope that it can get. Your financial support will help us continue to put love first. Thank you.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures high and low. Give thanks to God in love made known. Creator, Word, and Spirit, one. Amen. One of the things I'm most grateful for in having been a part of creating Living the Questions is having had the chance to meet and get to know so many of my heroes some of the most influential people in my profession and people who have genuinely changed the world. And in the case of Jack Spong, that's meant 25 years of being able to call this giant of progressive Christianity a mentor, a confidant, and a friend. As an Episcopal priest and bishop, Jack was instrumental in integrating a racially divided church ordaining the first women as priests and bishops, and both welcoming LGBTQ people into the church and as ordained priests and bishops. All the while, his books have sold over a million copies, and his robust speaking schedule has taken him all over the world, inspiring and encouraging a demographic he's taken to calling the Church Alumni Association. Many of you at the Fountains first met Jack when he and Christine came to Arizona to be a part of baptizing Maddie and Sam back in 2006. On one of his return visits in 2010, Jack offered a message based on John 10.10, 10, which we're dipping into the archives to share with you today. It seems especially apropos during the pandemic as so many people are struggling with feelings of isolation and loneliness and meaning. For us to be reminded that we are not terrible people, always on the verge of being punished by a vengeful God, but we're never to be repeated creations, called to be all that love can empower us to be. That old cliche, Jesus saves, is as threadbare as it is still popular, unfortunately, with the laziest of Christians. It not only begs the neurotic question, saves you from what, but serves as a way to create divisions and conflict among people. It also comes in handy when unscrupulous preachers want to scare vulnerable people into doing their bidding. In fact, a fair number of Christians have misappropriated the pandemic as some kind of grand test of faith, promising that if people just trust in Jesus enough that Jesus will save them from illness and death, only to discover that the virus really doesn't care what Jesus thinks. Claiming that Jesus' role as Savior is going to protect them from the coronavirus, a pastor in Louisiana said that his church will comply with social distancing requirements when they sell popsicles in hell. Well, since then, at least one of his parishioners has died of COVID, and the lawyer that they hired to sue the state was hospitalized with the virus. It's so easy to corrupt the idea of Savior into fraudulent schemes and theological tangles that Jesus would have never recognized or condoned. So I'm grateful to be able to share this reflection from Bishop John Shelby Spong on whether or not especially today, Savior is the best word to use for Jesus. Our words of wisdom are from John 10.10 10, and taken from John Shelby Spong's Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism. To have the courage to be oneself, to claim the ability to define oneself, to live one's life in freedom and in power is the essence of human experience. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, said the Christ of the fourth gospel. True Christianity ultimately issues in a deeper humanism. That is why 
any attitude that kills the being of another person is an affront to the meaning of Christ. To be a humanist is to affirm the sacredness of life. Jesus touched the depth of being, and the Christ experience is nothing less than our call to be who we are inside the love of God. I worship this Jesus when I claim my own being and live it out courageously, and in the process, call others to have the courage to be themselves. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. If I were to examine with ordinary people sitting in ordinary churches around the world, the names that they use to refer to Jesus most frequently, I believe that they would say we call him Savior, we call him Redeemer, we call him rescuer. Those are at least the names that I run into most often when people refer to the one that we call our Christ. I'd like to suggest that there may be two things wrong with those designations. First of all, to say of Jesus that he is primarily the Savior, the Redeemer, and the Rescuer is to say of you and me that we are primarily understood as people who need to be saved or redeemed or rescued. It might sound good and flattering as a description of Jesus, but it doesn't exactly say things that are good and flattering about you and me. So that's the first thing that causes us almost inevitably to concentrate on our sinfulness, our brokenness, our fallenness, our need for rescue instead of on the greatness and the wonder of God and life and love. So I think it puts the emphasis on the wrong part of the Christian faith. The second thing that I think is wrong with our primary use of those words is that the New Testament doesn't use them. St. Paul, in all of his epistles, uses the word Savior only once and never the word Rescuer or Redeemer. The first gospel to be written, Mark, never uses the word Savior. The second gospel to be written, Matthew, never uses the word Savior. Luke, the third gospel, uses it twice. But the first time it uses it, it's referring to God, not to Jesus. It's in Mary's song in the birth narratives that we call the Magnificat, where she talks about God, my Savior. And the only other time in Luke's gospel where the word Savior is used is when the angel speaks to the shepherd and says, unto us is born this day a Savior. And the word Savior is used only one time in the fourth gospel. It is not the primary designation of Jesus in the New Testament. The primary word in the New Testament that we use to describe Jesus is either Christ which is a title and not his name. I do think people get that confused. We've said Jesus Christ so long and so frequently that people think that must be his first and last name. So if he had gotten married, his wife would have been Mrs. Christ. <laughs> and if he had children, they would have been Johnny Christ and Mary Christ. <laughs> it's a title, it's not a name. And the word Christ and the word Messiah and the word Lord all come from the same word. And that's the primary word that is used to describe Jesus. Now let's look at these primary words and see what the earliest Christians said and felt and believed about Jesus. The word Messiah the word Christ, Christ is a Greek word, Christos, which tries to translate a Hebrew word, Mashiach, from which we get both Messiah and Christ. And because the Roman world didn't understand what a Messiah was, because that's a primarily Jewish word, they translated Messiah or Christ with the word Kurios, which means Lord. 
And in a Gentile world, to call Jesus Lord meant something quite different from what it meant in a Jewish world. And so these titles are quite confused. Let me try to unpack them for a moment. The Hebrew word underlying Christ, Messiah, and Lord is Mashiach. Mashiach is a simple word. It simply means the anointed one. That's all it means. The anointed one. And it was born in the Hebrew language as a name for the king. If you know the Hebrew scriptures well, you'll know that the prophet Samuel anointed Saul to be the first king of the Jewish nation. And that he was incapable of sustaining his dynasty, primarily because he and all of his sons except one were killed in a battle of Mount Gilboa. And the one remaining son was a crippled boy named Ishbosheth. You can use that if you ever want to impress somebody at a party with your biblical knowledge. And he was simply not capable of accepting the responsibility of the king. And so it passed to David. But all, and so David was anointed again by Samuel. The anointed one was the name of the king. And because the Jewish people saw in the king the face of the entire nation, they used extravagant titles. They called the king who stood for the whole people God's child, God's son, God's only son. That simply meant that the Jewish people believed that they were God's only chosen people. It had no other connotation, at least when the word was originally used. And that's about all the word anointed one, Mashiach, meant during all the years that they had kings who were of the house of David. David was anointed and crowned and enthroned about the year 1000 BCE. And kings in the line of David ruled until 586 BCE. When the last Davidic king, a man named Zedaliah, surrendered to the Babylonians. And the Babylonians took all of his sons and heirs. And one by one they brought them the child before Zedaliah and they murdered the heir. And then after all the heirs had been killed, they put out Zedaliah's eyes and took him into captivity in Babylonia so that the last thing he would ever see was the murder of each of his children. And he died a broken man in a Babylonian prison. But what happened historically at that moment was that the title Mashiach, Anointed One, Messiah, was freed from an actual human being. Now that presents some interesting things. As long as there was an actual human being who was the king, the concept was always tempered by the reality of this very human creature. And nobody began to think about Messiah as being something supernatural or unusual or even divine. But when there is no king, then the minds are free and the concepts can begin to grow and to expand. Harry Truman once said, you can talk politically if you go back far enough in the American scene, <laughs> Harry Truman once had his, his ratings fall into the high 20s. He had a 27, 28% approval rating. And someone went to Harry Truman and said, aren't you upset that your approval ratings have gotten so low? And he said, no, not at all. He said, they're always comparing me now with the ideal Republican. <laughs> but as soon as there is a real Republican who is my competitor, then his ratings will go down and mine will go up. So it's not a big problem. Well, that's exactly what happened. As long as there was a real king who had foibles and weaknesses, then you don't fantasize about the ideal king. But in 586, there was no longer a real king. And the concept of the anointed one, the Messiah, began to enter into the fantasies and expansions of the Jewish people. And they began to dream about this ideal king who would someday come 
and restore the fortunes of the Jewish people and restore the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple that the Babylonians had destroyed. And these fantasies were all over the lot. Sometimes they were quite militaristic. The anointed one, the Messiah, will come with great angelic armies and defeat all our enemies and make us powerful and wonderful again. Sometimes this image became supernatural. The book of Daniel suggests that the Messiah will actually be a divine figure who will come on the clouds of heaven to establish God's will on earth. But there were some other images. The book of Zechariah, with which most Christians are not very familiar. I expect you haven't read it recently. It's the next to last book in the Bible if you'd like to try. But the book of Zechariah portrays the Messiah as the shepherd king. They even suggest of him that he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And the people to whom he will betray, be betrayed are those who buy and sell animals in the temple. And he will hurl the silver back into the temple. Or the people to whom it's paid will hurl it back. It's a very interesting story. And clearly the early Christians borrowed some of the details from that story in order to tell the story of their conviction that Jesus is the Messiah who was anticipated. And probably the most dramatic of the images of Messiah would be found in chapters 40 through 55 of the book of Isaiah. And that's material with which you are all familiar, whether you've ever read Isaiah or not. Because a man named George Frederick Handel took the words from 40 to 55 of Isaiah and turned them into the musical oratorio called The Messiah. And so the words are very familiar. And we listen to those words and we think that a Messiah is, I mean that Isaiah is talking about Jesus. But Isaiah is talking about a figure that he has created, a literary figure, that he calls the suffering servant. And the suffering servant is one who suddenly recognizes that the tiny, almost pathetic little nation of Israel will never again rise to greatness, will never again dominate the world, will never again rule the people of the world. And so he says the only way you can be God's anointed is to be willing to absorb the hostility and the pain of the world and to give it back as love. And again, that portrait became so important to the early Christians that they drew constantly on the material from Second Isaiah to tell the Jesus story. Most of the details of the crucifixion story in the gospel tradition, especially the synoptics of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, most of the details of the crucifixion come right out of Isaiah 53. They drew heavily upon the fantasies, thoughts, dreams, and myths of the Jewish people to try to make sense out of the experience of Jesus. A couple of other things about this word Messiah. When there was no king, and when these fantasies began to grow, they began to apply the word Messiah to any life in which they believed they heard the voice of God speaking to them. They also began to apply the word Messiah to any life that they believed they saw the will of God being acted out. And one of the more dramatic illustrations of this was again in the book of Isaiah where they even call the king of the Persians who was not circumcised, who was not a reader or studier or follower of the Jewish law, but they called him God's anointed one, God's Messiah, God's Christ, because they saw in Cyrus the will of God being acted out. Cyrus had conquered the Babylonians and had set the captive people free. So there was this other connotation 
Messiah is one in whose life we hear the word of God, through whose deeds we see the will of God being acted out. That was the concept more than any other that you'll find deep in the New Testament as they tried to process their Christ experience. It was at Caesarea Philippi that Jesus asked his disciples who they think he is and they go through a random selection. Some think you're Jeremiah, some think you're John the Baptist returned from the dead, some think you're one of the prophets of old. And then Jesus said, but who do you believe I am? And Simon Peter, who seems to have suffered from hoof in mouth disease, <laughs> he always put his foot into his mouth when he spoke. Simon Peter said, well, you are the Christ, you are the Mashiach, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus began to tell him what Messiah meant. It meant giving your life away, not being victorious. It meant loving in the face of abuse. And Peter said, oh Lord, that's not the kind of Messiah I'm interested in. And that's when Jesus said, you've got to get behind me, Satan. A very interesting passage. So when we today begin to think about who Christ is for us, what it is that we believe, what it is that we experience from this Christ, maybe we ought to inform our minds more deeply, not about the theological patterns of Christianity as they have expressed themselves through 2,000 years of creeds and doctrines and dogmas, but maybe we ought to go back to our original sources and try to interpret the power of the original experience. Let me try to say it this way. There is a difference between the way you and I experience God or the way you and I experience this Christ figure and the way we explain how we experience it. The experience itself is real and it may well be eternal. But the explanation of the experience is always bound by time and space because you cannot explain except in vocabulary that is time bound and time warped. And so there is no such thing as a human explanation of anything that will ever last forever. Illustrate that by recognizing a simple little, little illustration. Epilepsy in the first century was identical with epilepsy in the 21st century. The symptoms were the same. The experience was the same. But if you could go back to a medical journal of the first century and listen to how that experience was explained to first century people in first century language, and then you would read a medical bulletin from the 21st century explaining what the experience of epilepsy was. You would not believe that you were talking about the same experience. Explanations always change. Explanations always die. The experience alone is that which is eternal. So we can debate and fight about creeds and doctrines and dogmas because that doesn't matter. What really matters is the integrity and the eternity of the experience. What did people experience in Jesus of Nazareth that caused them to say, God was in this Christ? I think the only thing you can do is to look at the reports in the New Testament. They experienced in him a life that was so whole, so free, so without boundaries that it could be said of him when you stand inside the Christ experience there is no longer a Jew and a Greek there's no longer a male and a female there's no longer a slave and a free person and you could add all of the human distinctions you want to this list there is no longer left-handed and right-handed there is no longer black and white there is no longer Jew and Buddhist. There's no longer gay and straight. 
There's something about the Christ experience that lifts us beyond the boundaries that separate us from one another and calls us into a new community of oneness. And they were quite convinced that only God could do that. So God had to be the meaning of this Christ. Second thing that they experienced about this Christ was a love that was not bounded. There was nothing you could do. There was nothing you could be that would separate you from the love of Christ as the story was told. Betray him, he loves you. Deny him, he loves you. Persecute him, he loves you. Forsake him, he loves you. Murder him, and he loves you. How else can a life say that the love of God does not have a boundary? How else can a life say there is nothing any of you can ever do, nothing any of you can ever be, that will separate you from the love of God that we have met in Christ Jesus. He was the source of love, and love is the essence of God. And the essence of God flowed through the life of Jesus and called us all to a new understanding of what it means to be human. And the third thing that I think you see in the gospel experience of Jesus is that he had the courage to be everything that he was created to be. On Monday, Thursday, well, let's go back a little earlier. On Palm Sunday, as Jesus was said to have ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey receiving the accolades and the praises of the people. And they were saying things like verses from the 118th Psalm, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And some of the people wanted to make him their king. That's pretty heady. If anybody wanted to make you or me their king, I suspect we would want to pay some attention to that. There's nothing quite so powerful as what I call the sweet narcotic of human praise. And sometimes people sell their souls and become something different from what they really are in order to play to the popularity of the crowds and to achieve power. But look at Jesus. As he journeyed down that cross, that road, from the Mount of Olives that was going to wind up on the cross, and the people were cheering, and he was probably never so popular, he knew who he was so deeply that his head was never turned in response to human praise. That's freedom. And then follow that story. On Palm Sunday, just five days later, that parade has become a journey to a place called Calvary. And there a cross is mounted and his body is nailed to that cross. And his life is being taken away from him. Now most people respond when someone's trying to kill them in a survival-oriented way. Whatever response is possible, they will scream, they will fight, they will bite, they will spit, they will curse. Whatever it takes, if that doesn't work, they will weep, they will whine, they will beg, they will plead, they will pray. Whatever it takes, they try them all. Life is so precious, we do not let it be sacrificed easily. But that's when you don't know who you are. But if you do know who you are, even when your life is being taken away, you can respond by giving love that empowers life in other people. And so look at the portrait. As he's dying, and there's no way off the cross except to die, but as he's dying, He's not trying to save another moment of his life. He knows who he is, he possesses his being, and in his dying moments, he gives his life away in love to others. So he's portrayed 
as offering forgiveness to the soldiers who drive the nails, as offering comfort and hope to a penitent thief who is also dying, as offering consolation to his mother in her grief as one gospel alone suggests, and as reaching out to the people that he sees beneath him, both his followers and those who are hostile. The last picture we have of the living Jesus is one who was so free, so full, so whole that he could give himself away in the last act of his life. So in the life of Jesus, we see the meaning of life empowering us to live. We see the source of love empowering us to love. We see what Paul Tillich called the ground of being, empowering us to be all that each of us is capable of being. That's why he is Messiah, anointed one, Mashiach, Christ. In his human life, God is experienced as uniquely and powerfully present not a great supernatural God up above the sky, but the God who always is revealed in calling people into the fullness of life, in freeing people to love beyond the boundaries of your own fears, and in enabling you to be all that you can be. Because when you live fully, you make the source of life visible. And when you love wastefully, you make the source of love visible. And when you dare to have the courage to be all that you can be, you make the ground of all being visible. That's why we claim that God was in Christ. And that Christ is the secret of your life and of mine. Too short to 
we reach across the physical divide that separates us, let us offer these words of blessing to one another. May God, the heart of life, be deep within us. And Jesus, as the Christ, be present in our very being. And may the Spirit inspire our search for truth, compassion, and peace. Amen.